And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Key Elements of a Successful Data Governance Program, sponsored today by Alation. It is the latest installment in the monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that, that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to chat to network with everyone. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to the recording of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to John for a brief word from our sponsor, Elation. John, hello and welcome. Yeah, uh, hello, Shannon. Great to work with you again. I always look forward to these sessions. And uh, this, one is, this one is certainly no different. Um, so it's great to be with you. Let me get to the top of my slides here. There we go. And uh, it's certainly a pleasure for us to be able to, uh, to sponsor uh, Peter. Uh, I've long admired Peter. You know, he's a force in our industry with all the, the books published, uh, all the articles written, and all the education that he's, he's given all of us. So it's certainly our pleasure uh, to, uh, to sponsor uh, Peter today in this, in this educational session. Um, as you can see on the screen, I'm uh, Alation's field CTO, and um, I want to thank all of you for being here today um, and uh, for giving, giving all of us this opportunity to convey some of what we're learning uh, with, you know, from our work with, our, with all of you, uh, frankly, and, um, and to, um, you know, to share that with you, to hopefully have you take away some, some best practices and some tips for your own work. Um, you know, I do not want to do the typical vendor commercial. So I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm sure many of you are well familiar with Alation. Um, and uh, if you're not, <laughs> that's the reason our website exists. I welcome you to, to go out there and have a look. Uh, we are the leading uh, data governance provider as um, assessed by you know, organizations like Forrester, um, putting us in the uh, well in the upper right-hand corner of, the, of their, of their uh, four quadrant, you know, the proverbial four quadrant assessment uh, wave matrix. Uh, we're also the data governance partner of the year with, uh, with Snowflake. Uh, we have many other, you know, accolades and we're growing really, really quickly. But again, it all comes down to all of you and our customers and, um, and, and, and helping our customers succeed, right? All that other stuff is, uh, you know, uh, secondary to say, uh, to say the most. Um, so it really comes down to our customers. So I just want to share four things uh, that we are focused on as a company, and most importantly, our customers are focused on. And these all dovetail with um, with Peter's material. I was really excited to see we're, I think, 100% in lockstep um, around this idea of governed, uh, uh, you know, our guided data governance, I should say. Um, because in our customers' world, um, you know, they're really focused on um, using a catalog to lead governance. And there's a really important point that, uh, you know, that there's this dashed line horizontally across the screen. And that's because we as Alation, and, and I think it's fair to say our customers view uh, the catalog and a governed catalog as a business application. So it's not a storing platform, you know, pushed on business users and analysts and data scientists. It's not a policy platform pushed on them. Uh, it certainly does all those things, and they're incredibly important. But it's a guided environment, again, to use um, one of Peter's words that he's he's going to teach us more about in just a few minutes. And um, and so, most most importantly, it's their platform. It's the analyst platform. It's the data scientist platform. It's the rank and file employees platform uh, to find and understand and trust their data. And it is it it is made better uh, by the governance program and by the people who do the great stewardship work, right? That's, and so this is really one of the fundamental principles that we've always been focused on and as um, more than ever before, it's, I would say it's, it's working um, and it's working incredibly well. The second thing we've always been focused on, again, coming back to this word um, guided, it is a guided stewardship experience with curation uh, or you might say crowdsourcing 
uh, by a great many people. You know, way back when it used to be that, you know, the notion was, well, stewards had to kind of do it all, right? They had to uh, not only define the rules, but they had to input, you know, all the metadata and they had to keep it all clean and they had to report on all of it. You know, we all know that's impossible task. Um, the world today has changed. And I think that there's an expectation that stewards are going to be the mentors, coaches. So using a few different words than guided. Um, but there's a network of people involved and that network uh, helps give lift and give scale, right, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to governing the data in all forms of, of its quality. That's metadata quality, it's timeliness, accuracy. It's also all those things for the data itself, not just the metadata, but the data as well. Um, the third thing is that we're very focused on driving community, which is kind of an extension of the prior topic, right, around this social capability, but very focused on community adoption and participation. And I think that takes many different forms. You know, one form of community is this, this people aren't just consumers of the great knowledge that people put in, but, but they, they share back, right? So that allows them to, uh, you know, do better self-service so they can, they can find their colleagues on their own who are the experts in particular domains, particular subject areas. But in the center diagram there, they can also share their own knowledge and then it's sort of a uh, reciprocal process, right? Uh, the more people put their knowledge in and they share what's working, what's not working. Um, not, that's about the data, but that could also be contextually about the policies around the data. It could be around metrics, terms, and all those things. It just makes a richer environment, really makes a, what you might call a, a knowledge base, if you will, uh, that's living and growing. Uh, and then of course, the steward guiding that entire process helping people know what good looks like um, and um, keeping the entire organization accountable uh, for that. So the last thing I'll share, and then it's gonna, we'll, we'll get on to the meat of the material with Peter. Um, you know, we don't just take these high level concepts, these three that I've, I've laid out for you uh, and leave it at that because we realize a lot of our customers, they really need best practices. They need a starting point. And so we provide uh, what we call the active data governance prescriptive approach. Um, and there's a lot packed in behind these, but essentially it's this, this continuous improvement process that goes from establishing your governance framework in the, the upper center, then moving clockwise all the way around, populating the assets, deploying and employing you know, stewardship, curating assets, applying policies, monitoring, measuring, and so forth. Um, and iteratively building that up. And that's another theme that I, that I know is in, in Peter's materials is, is this idea of iteratively building muscles over time and layering on. Don't, you know, uh, try not to, to bite off more than you can chew in the early days. So we very much are very pragmatically oriented, believe in an, in an iterative approach with this business facing um, process and application known as the catalog that's really governed well and gives people this ability to find, understand, trust, and just have this, this well of, of, uh, of information that they can have confidence in. And really it's the combination of all those things that, you know, that we see as forming this, you know, what can be an ambiguous term, data culture, but it's really the combination of all those things that help start to build culture, certainly starts to build data literacy. And so, um, again, just to sort of segue back over to, to Shannon and then Peter, I think, you know, Peter's all about literacy, right? In many different forms and educating people. Um, and so um, I'm excited to hear, hear from Peter today. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, we're focused on all these things. Our customers are um, seeing a, 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 you know, success like I've never seen before. And I've been around the industry a long time, 30 plus years, and I've seen governance go through various stages of maturity. And this is uh, this is the most excited I've probably been in terms of seeing customers succeed with governance and have it be established as part of the ongoing culture of the company and, and part of the ongoing operational process of the company. So again, super excited. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate you uh, listening to me for a few minutes. And now Shannon, I'm going to turn it back over to you. 
John, thank you so much. And to, thanks to Alation for sponsoring today's webinar and helping make these webinars happen. Uh, I see there's a couple questions coming in already. And if you have additional questions for John or about Alation, um, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen as he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar today. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. He has written dozens of articles and 12 books. And as John was saying, he, the most recent one is on data literacy. Peter definitely knows his uh, topic on that. Um, Peter has experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries. 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his expertise. Peter has spent many multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Well, that welcome. Thank, first of all, John, I'm speechless. Thanks for all the kind of things that you said about me. I'm certainly looking forward to continuing the discussion. We'll get uh, through my material here in a, a quick second, but uh, absolutely pleasure to be with everybody, Shannon. Uh, wonderful to get us started here. And uh, continuing on John's positive note, I think it's important to highlight that most data governance efforts are making progress in the right direction. There's things that can be done to speed it up. And I also believe that that sense of community that he spoke about is a really critical element, as well as the iteration portion of it. So thank you, John, for bothering to, to, to drive. We did not rehearse this, uh, but uh, again, it's, uh, I think, very, very nice to, to pull into this. So we're going to talk about data's confounding characteristics. Then we're going to move on to four key elements in my experience that describes what a practical and a, a uh, growing and an evolving data governance program should look like in this. And I'm just going to dive right on in with the old elephant and blind person's analogy here. And of course, you're familiar with the, the normal version of this, but data is also in a similar kind of a context here in that people approach data from different perspectives. And so they think data is different things very similarly to the way the blind people and the elephant did. Uh, again, there's been confusion in all of this because IT has thought that data is a business problem. And if they can connect to the server, my job is done. Whereas business thinks IT is managing it, what else would somebody with the title chief information officer actually be doing? Well, unfortunately, data has fallen through and into an enormous chasm between IT and the business. And it is our job as data professionals to try and repair that damage and, and restore harmony in the business on all of it. And today I'm going to move off into a different kind of a context here. This is, first of all, it was interesting to me to find out that the title of the book was actually The Princess on the P instead of The Princess and the P. And uh, that actually gives a very good analogy that management is actually understanding. And we'll get to that in storytelling. But the question is, what happens here if we don't get the data piece of it right? It locks in those imperfections for the life and it restricts additional investments and leverage that can be occurred uh, on each of that. Uh, organizations spend 20 to 40 percent of their IT budgets migrating, converting, or improving data. And this is part of the cause of data governance is to start to reduce these types of steps and use data in more direct service of the organizational mission. Of course, failing to do that makes everything take longer, cost more, deliver less, and present greater risk. Thank you, Tom DeMarco, as always, for this. And one of the first aspects of this to understand as data professionals is that part of our task is to figure out and help the organization figure out what is the wheat from the chaff in all of these. The problem is, of course, it's a bigger task than most people realize. Uh, organizing that process, one first asks the question, is well-organized data worth more? And the answer to that, I hope, is a resounding yes. But if you have trouble articulating that to anybody, just simply remind them that before uh, any computers were around, books were organized with lots and lots of metadata and removing, of course, the spine from a book and having the pages just sort of flutter about unnumbered would not be a good way to impart knowledge. So sometimes a negative example is what you need, but it clearly demonstrates the case that better organized data increases in value. And yet in our organizations, 80% of the data that is out there is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And 
most enterprise data is never analyzed. So we have these vast majority of data that is out there. And the only argument I ever get on this is that it's not 80, it's 85% in my organization or something perhaps worse. Uh, who is best qualified to accomplish this? And what this has left us with collectively is a concept called data debt. Uh, it slows progress. Again, same four things that Tom DeMarco was talking about, but it's the idea that this is going to slow things down. Think of it as, as uh, you know, bad stuff in your veins, keeping your heart from pumping correctly. And what you wanna do is of course get back to zero, but that typically involves undoing some stuff and, and requiring new skills. And this is part of the exciting world that's going on in the governance area. Let's just give you a value perspective on it real quickly. Uh, this is an article from Forbes obviously last year, and it talked about in 2020, which was not a great time for the airlines, American Airlines had been valued at $6 billion by the market, but the Advantage program data was valued between 20 and $31 billion. United had similar numbers here. Uh, the answer as to why this occurs is, of course, in fact, data debt. Let's jump on to our next topic then, and that is keeping data governance focused practically. So the first question is how old are we as a profession in the data world? And if we compare ourselves to the accounting world, we're not very old. Uh, we can date ourselves back to uh, Augusta Ada King and her wonderful insight that this weaving loom was something controllable and that the control that they were using in those days could also be program to control math. What an insight uh, onto this. So while accounting has been around for 8,000 years, uh, we really have been around maybe for 300 uh, if we expand it. So this newness is important. And one of the things we do is to try to figure out what is happening out there. Now, this is a wonderful survey. I'm gonna spend just a minute here and I urge you to check out the survey at newvantage.com. Uh, Randy of Tom have done a great, great service here. The data here is actually 2022. And I realize I'm looking at the slide and seeing it's a little confusing right at the moment. Um, but the question is, are you driving data with business? No. Uh, are you competing on analytics? Are you managing data as an asset? You can see these numbers get abysmally worse. I have other numbers. They have other numbers that they've put together. But the most important statistic that they took away from this is the upper right-hand corner where it says 2018. In 2018, the question was to these thousands of business people who are working in the business and analytics world uh, are your problems primarily technology or people in process and you can see the answer in 2018 was 19% to 80% and over the years has uh, just continued to hover in that same 10 to 1 or, or, or 5 to 1 ratio which just says we need to be looking at people in processes and 80% of the data challenges are people and process based and this is the goal the focus this is why governance was invented and this is why we're going to do data governance in these areas. So let's start out and just put some context on it. Your corporation, whatever it is, has some form of governance, probably, I uh, can't say that authoritatively, and people will be familiar with it. IT is getting better about being governed. The idea of aligning IT strategy with a business strategy and then producing measurable results, coming up with metrics and, and a return on investment, and then specific foci in these area. Notice, by the way, in all of these foci, none of them are on data. Uh, and so that's an interesting piece. Uh, again, corporate governance, IT governance. Now let's look at some definitions of data governance. And I'm not going to read these to you. These are all good definitions put together by some friends and, and colleagues uh, on all of these, including the uh, Dama Dimbach that is here. Uh, those are difficult definitions, though, to explain to somebody in an elevator ride. So I like to use a very short definition. Data governance is managing data with guidance. And that, of course, immediately begs the question, would you want your only non-degrading, non-depletable strategic asset managed without it? And the answer is, of course, no. As we work our way up the food chain in our organizations, the question changes just slightly. And that is that people get further away from the actual data. They think they're not involved, but in fact, they are involved. They are making data decisions and they don't know it. And this is a problem leading to what I call the bad data decision spiral. Again, that as governance professionals, you'll have to be aware of this. So business decision makers and technical decision makers are not data knowledgeable. This leads to bad data decisions, poor treatment of organizational assets and poor organizational data quality and poor organizational outcomes. That is a challenge right there for starters in organizations. And uh, if you heard Morgan Freeman, he says, this is wrong. I just like the way he says it uh, in there on this. Let's take it another step though. Most organizations miss this one and, and they say, okay, so 
What's an example? And the most common example that I have seen literally a dozen plus examples of since the pandemic started is the instance of an organization installing Salesforce by a certain date and time in order to make a technical IT deadline. And that that same organization, unfortunately, learning very quickly thereafter that uh, the concept of having Salesforce filled with bad data is a very difficult one for customers to understand the difference between. And the customers just say, Salesforce isn't working for me, whereas of course Salesforce is working, but garbage in, garbage out. We'll come back to that in a little bit. The, the most important question then around this topic is how not how should we govern all this data? Because that's way too much and it's, you don't have the resources in order to do it. The right question is, how do we include this data item or should we include this data item within the scope of our practices? And regardless of what the answer is, document the reason for why you do that. Because of course you don't have the resources to do everything that you'd like to do. And that is the reason for strategy. Strategy exists to help focus the mind. Uh, it didn't really become a popular term in the business world until 1950 or so when the business consultants discovered it and made this thing of a grand plan. And I do mean a thing in the sense of the strategy. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day that had a 126 page data strategy. It's like, wow, well done. The original term before 1950 was described as a pattern in a stream of decisions. And that's much more of a process or an iteration, if you will, uh, than it is a thing. So let's take a look at three quick ones. Just for example, Walmart had a former business strategy. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I went back a slide instead of forward. Uh, Walmart had a former business strategy here. Uh, that uh, most of you are familiar with. And in fact, everybody on the Walmart Express and in Bentonville and every Walmart employee understands that Walmart's strategy is everyday low price. And if you make an error that supports their strategy, they generally will be supportive of the decision that you made around that. That's a very simple strategy. It's a pattern in a stream of decisions. A second example of strategy is Wayne Gretzky's, and it's got a wonderful little Wikipedia article, but basically what it says is he skates to where he thinks the puck will be. Because of course the alternative is to chase something hard and plastic that travels much faster than you do around the ice, which probably not a terribly fruitful activity. Strategy example number three here is sort of a way in which our military might apply something here. If we're here, the good guys and the bad guys are over there, we're gonna employ one type of a strategy. If our position happens to be here, where we're the good guys and we have the high ground and the bad guys have the low ground, uh, we're gonna employ a different strategy than we would if the bad guys have the high ground and uh, we have the low ground. So again, these pattern in a stream of decisions is a much more important concept because this pattern guides work group activities. As people are working in these areas, this is how they are taking guidance. This is how they understand their group members will work in the same way they do. And let me just point out that here is a relatively complex data governance environment that one organization is attempting to put together. Uh, it, again, notice it's more complex than the strategies that I just described to you. Um, as a data strategy, the key is to give the organization some sort of high level guidance that focuses on business goal achievement, because that's where you're gonna have people having questions. What are we trying to do and why are we trying to do it or what are we trying to do first? It articulates how data can be usefully applied to support the organizational strategy and involves a balance of proactive and reactive measures in this area. Data strategy then drives the organ, excuse me, the organizational strategy drives the data strategy. And the only purpose of a data strategy is to develop increased data support for the organizational strategy. Question of data strategy then factors into data governance by articulating what are these data assets doing to support the strategy? How can we make them better in that process. And the feedback, of course, comes back, how well is all that working? We get the work done in governance, oftentimes through stewards. And John mentioned that they were uh, much overworked and, and underpaid. And I certainly agree with all of that. Uh, we're still learning as a profession uh, to, to get out of here. But nevertheless, it is the stewards that we turn to when we want something to actually be implemented in that type of a context. And let's just take a quick look at it, uh, the goals, the organization should be supporting data strategy expressed as business goals as something tangible so that we can claim that we've had a movement. The needle has has uh, uh, has moved in this area. Boy, a movement, that sounded bad, didn't it? Uh, the uh, data governance 
group should be talking on metadata and the language should be metadata that's spoken in these areas. Uh, failure to do so is very problematic. And of course, what we really want is the stewards to be doing this type of work, expressing these metadata goal business goals and how they impact each other and tying it together. And of course, the perfect tool for something such as this and the general starting place for many data governance initiatives is the data catalog that goes into that. The uh, governance role then has to also be understood. And this is something that you'll have to work out with your individual organizations. Right now, in most organizations, we can claim that they have less perspective into the whole process than they'd like to have. But they will start a data governance initiative. And most people understand data governance improves data over time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it oftentimes is perceived as slow relative to the business challenges that the organization is facing. And so they also say, can somebody go out there and actually fix something? Uh, you know, let's not just make the next generation of, of uh, engines coming off the assembly line better. Let's in fact fix the ones that are out there at this point in time. So the data improves as a, a result of focus into this. Again, this will give better perspective. We can now start to mature the organizational structure, add in the components of a data governance program and start to celebrate things that happen in the data world. And while that's a, a good thing, you'll notice that the expression that I put between data things happen and organizational things happen is the approximately equal sign. And the reason for that is because we're not as good at that as we'd like to be, and we need to get better uh, at it. We're very good at celebrating data things that happen. Uh, I was talking to somebody at a job interview the other day, and they said, yeah. So I said, so tell me what you've done. They said, oh, I wrote 10 reports. That's great. Did anybody use your reports to make any money? Oh, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, that is a place we need to go. Yes, I'm sorry to... to bring you to the cold realities, but budget-driven processes are in fact going to require just that type of an approach. So let's give some value around this concept here. Uh, right now, we've got people that are managing data assets and trying to get better IT outcomes and trying to do some support for strategy and maybe there's a knowledge worker improvement exercise. This gets to confusing though, and people don't really kind of understand that there's usually a root cause to all of these that, that comes about in a much, much easier fashion. And that is to say that most organizational challenges, first of all, have a root cause of data. And if they don't, uh, they don't really exist as, as challenges. We haven't articulated them precisely enough. That said, the challenge is not recognized as a data challenge by those experiencing the challenge because it's filtered through some sort of business process or IT system. And so really remains for somebody to connect to these dots and say these are poor results all stemming from a hidden data factory that perhaps exists within your organization. Again, thank you, Tom Redmond, for a wonderful term to describe all of this. Understanding that root cause analysis is a part of data governance and can only occur through the type of community efforts that talk about building up Eliminating data debt requires a team with specialized skills. They're going to deploy a repeatable process and develop for themselves sustainable organizational uh, skill sets that they will be able to articulate. Uh, I like to, to say it's kind of like a fire station way to think of it. Most people don't imagine that the fire people are out there fighting fires. And I do like to say, harmless. Paper clips and duct tape are valuable data governance uh, technologies uh, around all of these things. Although the paper clip is the biggest barrier to management understanding, one page is, is really about what you want to do with them. But the idea is, yes, there will be some clever things that we'll do in data governance, some uh, policy-driven things that will take some time. But just as the, the fire department doesn't sit around waiting for a fire uh, to happen, they go out and they do all sorts of education and, and knowledge training and uh, awareness and, and uh, just generally promoting the idea of fire safety. These are wonderful things to do. And again, the focus in the data governance area has to be similarly divided between proactive and reactive according to the organizational strategy. So you can see it comes back into play. 
lack of data governance is costing organizations millions in productivity in siloed and redundant efforts and poorly thought out hardware and software purchases, delayed decision making. Again, waiting till initiatives get much worse. And as I said before, consuming 20 to 40% of IT spending annually. Again, keeping it practically focused on strategy is key to being successful in this. Another key is the ability to exist at a programmatic effort uh, in this. Data and IT operate at a different cadence or rhythm. Data is not a project. IT has gotten very good correctly at creating new projects out of IT. It's a sensible way to do it, and it's been the best way to improve the overall throughput on this. But data evolves, and more importantly, it evolves at a different cadence. And this concept means we need to separate and make external to, and most importantly, precede system development activities. These data programs have to drive the IT programs, whereas it has been the other way around up to this point in most organizations. Uh, most will come down and say, what's the difference between data governance and data management? Again, governance is sort of the policy level, which is why some people say it takes a long time. Uh, and why it is a good idea to, to focus in on practical things that you can do uh, in terms of now as well as later. But it says guidance and direction. And you know, we might say that all information not marked public should be considered confidential. Uh, again, firehouse metaphor is the idea of, of going out and being active sometimes, but also being proactive in the times that you're not actually fighting fires. Data management, on the other hand, is the business of planning, controlling, directing uh, information assets to their target by solving specific business challenges around those areas. And yet, even this level of understanding that we now have among us is problematic in organizations. Uh, most people, you know, there's data, we've got data management and data governance. We just talked about the differences, but what happens? Yes, that's the good old Charlie Brown, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they don't appreciate the difference, so don't try and explain it to them. It just gets confusing. Instead, talk about your data program, because the key is to drive home the fact that there's no way that you are ever going to not need your data program. Your data program will last at least as long as your HR program uh, going forward, and it needs to have the same level of programmatic support around that. If you haven't seen this before, it's bad on me. I am president of DAMA International, and quite frankly, this is a wonderful piece of articulation about what does it mean to do data management. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually show anything about doing. It's got a lot of very good words uh, on there and allows us to articulate the idea in a nice framework uh, around that. But most organizations fail to understand from a data governance perspective is that it's going to be involved. And that's, of course, why it's at the center of the DEMA wheel. Uh, for example, when organizations start out on their journey in data, they don't generally understand the rule of three, which is likely that you're going to need three parts of this pie, if you will, uh, in order to get a complete focus on things. For example, an organization may start out to build sort of a data warehouse and get the idea that they should have data governance and quality because perhaps this is the second or third time that they've built the data warehouse. By the way, the average is seven. Uh, and in doing this the second time through, they said, yes, we need to put quality in before we get started. And uh, also we want to make sure that we have governance that make sure that's going to occur going forward. So it's not just the technical design of the warehouse, but making sure the warehouse is full of good quality data. Well, that may require still a third application of it, which may then say we need to focus in on metadata instead of data quality. And again, that these shouldn't be one versus the other. It's mainly a cycle, cyclical approach to say, what are we gonna focus on this cycle? You'll notice we've given two X points for data warehousing and data governance, one X for metadata management. And if we go to our third example on this as well, maybe now we've decided the reference uh, and master data might be a strategy that would be better applied to this specific warehouse in order for us to do this. So the idea is that data governance is going to be involved in almost every aspect of data going forward as you start it. And the idea that we're going to be done with it at some point in time is nuts. Uh, and you have to get the ability to tell people that. Now, 
when they ask, what are we doing? Tell them the question is not, what are we doing? The question is, what are we doing first? And what we're doing first is things that further the organizational strategy will make a Venn diagram for data that is used by the business that needs to be improved and add a third component here of saying, if we have a choice, let's practice some additional data skills that perhaps we have not been able to up to this point. And focusing in on all three of those is really sort of a sweet spot that will allow us to go forward and do this. And notice this is different because we've practiced in the past what we call application centric development. And that's the idea that we've taught for the past 50 years. You have strategy, then you should apply IT and data or information falls after the fact on that. Uh, this ensures that the processes are very narrowly formed around the application and limit your data reuse. Uh, there's a wonderful book on it by Dave McComb uh, that's out there at Amazon. So the wrong way to think about data strategy is to look at it as organizational strategy and then IT strategy and then a data strategy coming below it, Morgan Freeman. This is wrong. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Uh, this is the correct way to do it. And it's the idea that data strategy is going to influence your IT strategy to a greater extent than your IT strategy is going to influence your data strategy. Meaning that we only need to change everything and change from strategy driving data and information and then IT projects. Now that's challenging and it requires a lot of rice bowls to be moved. But if you think about it, the data as the programmatic piece that doesn't change much is much more stable over time should in fact be the framework that we use then to drive outward on IT projects. This will allow us to create the process architecture the way it should be for the organization instead of an application and app driven pieces. And finally, maximize our data reuse around that. The uh, talk on data strategy does a little bit of that as well. So to try and get improved effectiveness, data governance is central to data management and therefore also central to digitization efforts. We're gonna take a look at those in the next section up here, but you've got to decouple it from the IT strategy in order to make it work. Next one is to gradually add ingredients. And I wanna shout out to Mark uh, uh, Johnson for coming up with this wonderful insight. He was doodling online, so we weren't actually physically present. He said, data from digital, I'm not sure what that leaves, but I do know that if I go the other way and subtract digital from data, I've still got the data. And I thought that was a very insightful uh, way of thinking about it because of course you can't just go digital by spelling the word data, it doesn't work. And consequently it becomes problematic when organizations try to add it afterwards, very much like trying to engineer security or other type of uh, ill at ease into your framework afterwards. So once again, if you start with garbage data and the perfect model, you're still going to re reap digital garbage results. Maybe a new term there. Again, our term for it, of course, is garbage in, garbage out, or G-I-G-O. And this is true, of course, whether you think in the center is data warehouse, machine learning, machine intelligence, block, chip. AI, MDM, data governance, technology, whatever it is. And worse, we're probably doing these multiple imports of data in parallel to the same processes. So the first place that it makes sense to take a look at is to see if you can harmonize some of the process flows around this. Now, harmonizing the data will take you even further. That's a different issue. But the idea here is, of course, you need to get a handle on what's going on here. You can't just assume that it's been set up correctly. And of course, once then you pump good quality data into it, can you expect quality digital results? Anything short of that, you are going to get imperfect results over there. And just to pick on the machine learning community for a quick second, which no disrespect to them, but they've invented great learning algorithms, but they are almost completely bereft of good data <clears throat> to have. And that failure, Fortunately, to look ahead and try and attempt it is the main thing that is holding back progress in AI. We're not going as lofty as AI, <coughs> excuse me, but I am going to go for a data sandwich. Now, the idea is that in order to do what our organizations do, they are trying to leverage high performance automation. That means as a component of data literacy, a data supply that is probably of uneven quality and a data standard use that is maybe perhaps of uneven quality as well. Of course, trying to get to 
Perfection is not something you can snap your fingers for. It is a group process that must occur from collaborative means over time in order to do that. But we've got to do it because we need these three pieces to work together. And of course, this cannot happen without investments in engineering and architecture. So another key component in this area, even though we're gradually adding ingredients, is to say we want to do it in an engineering architecture fashion. I had to go all the way to India, this tea farm in India, where I found behind the cash register the sign that said quality engineering and architecture work products do not happen accidentally. Of course, that's a quote from J. Edward Deming, and uh, it's a shame I had to go all the way to India to see it. But then again, uh, I put the word data in there as well, because of course it is equally as true. Now I'm calling you today from this location uh, that's out there, and I'm showing you a picture of our barn, which had to pass a foundation inspection in order to get started. So this series of photographs documents the fact that the barn had a good quality foundation that passed a foundation inspection. In fact, it was a condition of the loan that the bank gave me in order to do this. Before further construction could proceed, they needed to verify the validity of the inspection certificate. It makes good business sense. Yes, absolutely. It makes good business sense. If I build a large barn on top of a poor foundation, uh, I will spend more money on vet bills than I will paying off the loan and the, bar, the uh, bank wouldn't be happy uh, given that as well. But there is no IT equivalent and this is a challenge for us. So one of the things we talk about in data governance it, are these frameworks. It's the idea that we're gonna eventually build these pieces in but not right away and certainly not right at the beginning where we know the least about what it is that we're doing. These system of ideas allow allow us to organize, to prioritize, to determine where progress is. Again, just a couple little rules in the building trade, right? Don't put up your walls until the foundation inspection is passed. But once you've done that, put on the roof so that you can work immediately in inclement weather and make it all dependent on continued funding. So now these next few slides are going to go by very quickly. Remember, this is recorded and that's what I'm intending. I'm not going to walk through them, but instead show you that the one framework I am most familiar with is the data governance framework from the DIMBOK, which simply is showing as an input process and output diagram. These are some of the original diagrams. They haven't changed much over the years. This was from Gwen Thomas, uh, who I believe will be coming out to bid us in June when we get to uh, San Diego for DGIQ. Our friend Rob Steiner put this one together. Uh, this was from the IBM Data Council, uh, data, excuse me, Data Governance Council. This one was particularly comprehensive, I found. Jill Duche at uh, Baseline Consulting, I believe, is the author of this particular one. This particular organization decided it was important enough from a governance perspective to give them a logo of some sort. I'm not sure why you would think sailboats and college professors, but uh, maybe I'm jaded. I don't know. Anyway, back to our, our context in here. The reason for those frameworks is to try and look at something to build. Likely none of them are perfect for you, but if you find one that is close to you, it is a great starting place in order to go forward. Now, speaking of support, the IT world, of course, has to support what we're doing here. So we're writing them in right away, but I'm now gonna talk about things on the left-hand side of the orange line being less specific and, and the roles more formally defined. And of course, the opposite on the other side, similarly above the brown line, they're more likely to govern and counter govern data, but spend less time doing it. Whereas down on the bottom half is where people are going to dedicate their time and encounter that governed set of data. So these are also components to think about whether this makes sense for your organization or not. It's pretty generic as far as that goes. And many organizations will draw a line around the left-hand side of the diagram and say, this is our data governance organization. And we put some motivations around it. Leadership is responsible for obtaining and maintaining access to resources, listening to data and feedback that comes through making some decisions that we ask the stewards to help out with, taking some action so that things actually change uh, around there. Uh, looking again for additional feedback, additional ideas, and obviously providing some guidance back should be the iteration loop that we're looking for. Notice I've simplified the diagram slightly in order to perhaps make it more palatable as we go forward. Finally, another component of this, just to tie it all back to where we were going, is that there's a list of things to be done to get started. This is not comprehensive. Please don't think of it that way. Um, although I do want to point out that John's diagram could be taken in the same way. And I want to make sure that I 
expressly clear. What I've seen a lot of organizations try to do is to go through this list on the left before they have experience in this. Uh, I don't believe Alation is proposing that. I think what they're suggesting is gradually layer these things in as you get better with it, because of course the cyclical approach, and I think we're entirely aligned in that respect. So I'm not saying don't do this, but I'm gonna quote, quote Herb Cohen, who has written a great book on negotiating, care, but not too much, all right? So let's go a little bit further forward. Again, we can look at goals and you can do the same thing with these that I did with the frameworks. You can look at each of these and spend years trying to get really good at it. Time box yourself, put an effort on it, evaluate that effort and decide whether it was sufficient or perhaps more should be included in this. And the key of course, is to look at all of these things and say, oh my goodness, you know, that seems like a lot to get started. And I want you guys to think instead of a different word, which is of course, evolve. We don't wanna go through and try to do a perfect job on that because we're not practiced at it. In fact, we will do this exactly once if we do it well, although uh, there are others that are starting in a repeat mode on this. I'll pick on our, my own Commonwealth of Virginia as a, a, a target in this case, which is that they're on their third specific iteration of trying to implement data governance well. And it's not that they haven't had a good effort at it, but it's been hard and they've been overly dependent on champions. And that has been a, a challenge around that. So the point of this slide, I'm actually gonna go back and build it again, cause I was battling uh, around it. This occurs once, whereas the part that you're going to repeat occurs on the right. And if I'm going to get good at something, I'd get good at the thing in the bottom right-hand corner. And if it looks a lot like plan, do, check, act, yeah, it's very similar in that context. And that's the way it should be thought of because the way to go through and build your data governance program is to see what your organization needs and what your organization needs is still probably an unknown when you compare back against what we're looking at specifically of what does the organization need to change? What are the things that are going to help your organization use your data in better support for the organizational strategy. And the loop on the right-hand side, just like all plan, do, check, act loops on the right-hand side is exactly what you need combined with what we were also talking about, the community. Now, once again, I wouldn't open it up to the community. Again, a bit of guidance at this point, just to give you a, a symbolic kind of thing. Lots of organizations I, I've gone to and, and spoken with them about this. And when we get to that stage, they then say, well, okay, so I really wanted to be part of the data stewards group, but I wasn't appointed. So I'm just going to sort of kick the sand over here and grumble about things. Uh, and I don't think that's really what you want to do. So rather than appointing your data stewards council, appoint the first round of data stewards. That way there can be a next round and the next round you can even do better than you did perhaps the first round. Uh, things like that are much better way to approach it. Whereas I've seen organizations try to come up with very precise details on definitions of 16 different types of stewards uh, in order to do this. And it just doesn't quite add up to the way you'd like it to add up uh, around that. So again, the part on the bottom right-hand side is what you're looking for, an environment, being able to work within this, get people and processes together around here, because that's where your data challenges are. We've got a, a couple of stories now to, to dive into, and the reason for that is quite simple. It does no good to be able to support data governance on strategy by a programmatic effort that you gradually get better at by adding scope of data, adding scope of stewardship, adding scope of subject areas, whatever makes sense, and probably some combination of everything I've at least described there uh, in order to get started. But it does you no good if you can't justify it. And storytelling has to be a key piece of this. So we're going to talk about a couple of quick stories here as we get back towards the top of the hour and see where we'll actually uh, uh, come back and we can have your discussion around this. And the first one is that when people start going digital, it's kind of important to be able to have at least an anecdote to say, are we thinking about this correctly? And the answer may be yes or maybe no, but a good way to do it is to look at what happened with respect to the world's first ever tweet. 
So this is a screenshot of the NFT of the world's first ever tweet that Jack Dorsey sent out. Uh, you can see uh, back in 2006, okay, setting up my stuff for Twitter. Again, down here in the bottom. Now, the process for this was that the individual, this SDI, was going to uh, sell the NFT and he thought it might make a, a proceed of getting more than $50 million uh, in order to do this. And uh, again, I think he was a bit disappointed. The, they were going for $48 billion and uh, they got $280 uh, as the bid. So digital is not something that you can simply throw words at. And I will also point out to us, by the way, we're on a data call, of course, at this point, uh, there are more chief digital officers out there than there are chief data officers. Uh, that's a challenge around things as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so you've now got a story that you can take with you uh, to um, help your organization think perhaps more clearly about what their focus is in the digital strategy area. A wonderful group that I worked with here for the next story is a group that had a very good way of expressing their local culture uh, had done this. They said, getting access to data around here is like that Catherine Zeta-Jones scene where she's having to go through all the lasers. Now, obviously we're dating ourselves as millennials in that context, but the, the key is this is a very cultural touchstone. It was uh, the idea, of course, if she was good at weaving her way through and, and achieving the prize, you know, that would be fantastic. Um, but of course, you don't want people and management was quite surprised when they found that this, they thought they had solved the problem because they had purchased a data warehouse and that should have solved their problem in their minds. Uh, again, from a perspective here, somebody bought some technology, but the technology was not correctly implemented and they didn't fail they failed to include the people and process components of that implementation which would have made the data warehouse uh, implementation more successful around that so whatever hooks it is that your organization has use them don't steal somebody else's they're not quite as much fun uh, given that sort of thing but certainly in your organization there are people that talk around this way uh, in order to do this uh, I was actually up on Wall Street at this time. It was fascinating to, to see what was happening here. But uh, on a particular day, uh, you'll see in just a minute, uh, that Bar Lehman Brothers went under and sold itself to Barclays, basically. And as part of the deal, there were 179 contracts that Barclays said, we're not going to buy those no matter what's happening. We'll buy the organization. We'll bring the name along. We'll get everything that comes with it. But we are not going to buy those 179 dodgy contracts. And that was, of course, the reason Lehman Brothers was going down as well was because they had gotten into some very strange things. Again, big short, uh, uh, certainly read up on it, going looking at that. This is exactly, of course, what happened. Now, in the process of doing the sale, of course, lawyers were involved and they went through and they used a spreadsheet and they hid the contracts that they didn't want to buy. So there were 179 lines in a spreadsheet that were hidden and then handed to a first year associate. Again, junior person, if you get the, the drift there. Uh, and of course it happened long after business hours. This has been written up. You can see the headlines on the other side of the, the screen here. And yeah, it's late night and it's there, this schlub work, you know, we go through and format and they didn't quite get. So the, the date of the sale closing was September 22, 2008. Uh, in there. And uh, they went before the judge and said, here you go. But they became unhidden by this associate uh, that was working on this and sale closed. And the judge, they appealed it. And the judge went back and said, nope, sorry. That's what it was. Uh, so you can believe around Barclays, the data governance around how to use spreadsheets is phenomenally uh, good, it's effective, and they do a, a really commendable job for unfortunately having to absorb the uh, data debt that came along with the uh, Lehman Brothers sale in that. Uh, another British example in this, uh, during the beginning of the pandemic, why on earth do you imagine that a health department official would have to know whether or not they were using the right version of Excel. And of course, the key there is the right version, whatever that means. But if you have a version of Excel that causes it to drop rows after you a certain level uh, and not happen to give any 
error messages as a result, uh, you undercounted the number of people who were working on the virus in this case. So it's a very, very problematic situation and clearly led to a number of situations here where we're now thinking that the virus counts, not due, of course, to spreadsheets or bad technology, but nevertheless is one third of what the actual count is uh, in here. And this, of course, contributes to that general sense. Well, you can see with each of these stories so far, there's been some kind of a grip. But what did happen with Lehman Brothers? And, uh, you know, and there was that a real story? Did it come out? Yes. And how did it turn out? Yes, the judge turned them down, right? Uh, you know, what, what about the, uh, the concept of did Catherine Data Jones actually get it? Yes, she and Sean Connery, I think, both uh, uh, got the gold and came away. And Jack Dorsey, of course, and uh, the, the tweets, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen with, with all of this. Um, there's a great article in Wired called There is No Inherent Reason to Trust the Blockchain, uh, which is uh, well worth reading uh, going through that. The, the last story here that we're going to do, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to switch there, is um, one about fan blades, which is very boring uh, in the sense that they are not, of course, boring. But if you're a jet engine ma manufacturer and you're able to put sensors on these engines, you might get from one sensor a probabilistic forecast of the maintenance. These things are high, high, high precision instruments, fascinating engineering, unbelievable quality control around this to the extent that when we had the one engine failure that we know of at this point, flight 1381 from Philadelphia a couple of years ago, they were able to trace the error back to the decision that was made in the factory uh, around this. So it's a, a fascinating, fascinating science for this. But think what happens if you go to 100 sensors. And the idea is that instead of understanding generally what's happening, we can find optimal monitoring targets, fine tune, which means the maintenance can be improved and safer. This means that we don't have to store things that we needed to in the past, that we can now try to get to better ways of understanding the systemic risk with which we approach these very, very important organizations. And for this one in particular, they saved a total of one and a half billion dollars over the time. Well, you can better believe that the data governance group was careful to run around and help do this. And the reason for this was because this was just one example of the part that this one system had played in the organization's move into the digital world. They had changed their model, transformed it entirely from a product-oriented model to a service-oriented model. There is no no more wrenching organizational transition that can occur beyond going out of business uh, on that. And yet they managed to accomplish it, accomplish it in a phenomenal way through in particular the use of storytelling around here. So to take it to the, the, the final sort of conclusion here, there's not much point in making your data better if you're also not going to make your people's use ability to use the data better as well. This gets again back to the literacy component. So data, there is an uneven understanding that people have approached it from different perspectives and for good reasons, understand data to be different things. There's nothing wrong with that, but our failure to understand it as a unified view with fractured views. And unfortunately, it all adds up to increasing organizational data debt. Uh, I, call it a stupidity tax in some of the groups that I work with uh, around this. It's a very harsh thing to say, but it's nevertheless uh, as, as true as it's going to be. So the focus then, and what does a gate keep to say data governance program need to have? It's gotta be focused on strategy. This is a young profession. The best we can tell is that the more you support strategy, the more uh, feedback you'll be able to get because people will understand what it is you're doing and be able to help you correct the course uh, around this. Again, the crowdsourcing model uh, to take into its logical extreme. That data governance can only be effective if it has the same level in the organization of continuous support as the HR group, uh, because it is central to what happens in data. And it's got to be not subsumed by an IT strategy, given all of that. Finally, we look to add ingredients bit by bit. Again, start with a small section of this. Make just a couple stewards, get them to work together as a team, spin the data up, 
yes, you'll get bigger bang if you go for bigger, but I've also seen that with bigger becomes bigger risk. And this is the same thing that the chaos report has told us all in all, the projects that work, the efforts that succeed, the programs that support to the greatest degree are small programs that grow to medium size over time, as opposed to large size, given all of that. Because what we're doing, whether it's digital or just data, sounds crazy for me to say just data, right? It's dependent on high speed automation in this. And that there's got to be some sort of a framework that we understand as a starting place, but perhaps not the vision we're gonna implement fully at the sense and that evolve this sense. But also if we can't tell the stories around this, none of this does us any good. So the need for data governance is increasing. It's a new discipline. Therefore, there is no one best way, but there is a better way for your organization, given those constraints. Keep it focused on the four elements that I've just gone over. And remember that the goal is to get better at what we do over time, because the more literate the organization it is, the easier the transformation is. Now, I don't normally recommend books uh, on this because some of them are, are better than others, but this is a good book, very good book by John Ladley. And the reason I'm showing it to you is twofold. One, he wrote the first version 10 years ago, and I asked him what had changed between the first and second version. He said everything. That's a good measure of how things are going in here. A couple website references for everybody on this. Again, uh, my own books are on sale at the moment that are out there, and we've got some upcoming events, including the uh, first of, uh, excuse me, first week in June, we're going to be in San Diego for DGIQ, so we'll be able to see Shannon around there. And uh, I think, Shannon, it's the top of the hour, so it's time to bring John back on and look forward to your discussion, everybody. Thanks so much. I love it. I hope to see lots of people in uh, San Diego in June. Very excited about that. Uh, so, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout. And somebody asked earlier too, if they can get a certificate of attendance for any of our webinars, you can email info at dataversity.net for a certificate of attendance um, and see if it applies to for your continuing ed for any certification you may have. So um, lots of great questions coming in here. Um, with this goes to John initially your um, uh, presentation in the beginning with the data mesh paradigm how is relation aligning with distributed governance at the data domain level yeah thanks Shannon and and uh, Peter <laughs> wow thanks for uh, all that great content that was that was amazing and I have to say your your audience is amazing because uh, this audience because I watched the numbers there was no drop off I mean it's amazing People are really absorb, absorbing all, all this content. So um, yeah, and I didn't know what that little uh, yellow, blue, yellow thing was in your lower left-hand corner until your last slide. I love that. What does it say? Like good good things with our uh, data, what bad things e still equals bad results, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I that's great. A, that's had great. a wonderful conclusion on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Thank anyway, back to the data mesh question. So yeah. I think uh, we live in exciting times, uh, data fabric, data mesh, uh, hot topics, uh, super hot topics. I think uh, data mesh as articulated by ThoughtWorks uh, is particularly intriguing, bringing some of the object oriented and you know, development world into the data world is, is certainly uh, a challenge and refreshing. I think one of those things for those of you not familiar with it, and by the way, we just, Alation, we just uh, did a four a part blog series on fabric and mesh. Uh, which I would point you to as for the resources, but uh, for the for the uh, blog that I did on the mesh, uh, you know, mesh is really about um, uh, uh, not evolution, as Peter's talking about revolution. It's really about taking um, the the centralized capability to build uh, things, data products, and push it into the business domains, into the business, and have it uh, wholly uh, owned in the business. Uh, and I mean that in the most dramatic uh, ways possible. So, uh, so with that comes this uh, desire, as it, expressed in the concept of data mesh, to have federated governance where these uh, domain teams uh, try to, you know, do their own thing yet adhere to governance practices and principles. Um, by the way, it's sandwiched uh, to go to Peter's sandwich uh, uh, analogy, which I love. It's sandwiched by doing the same with infrastructure, trying to not uh, reinvent the wheel. So, um, so where does, you know, elation position in terms of, or how do we fit with 
distributed um, or federated governance across these domain teams with data mesh, I'd say extremely well. Um, you can express as many domains and subdomains as you want inside the catalog. Uh, those domains certainly fit with the build teams and the agile um, teams that are going to be distributed in the business. What better place than in the catalog to express central policies and then have those policies uh, be attached and actionable by multiple, uh, multiple distributed uh, data product build teams out in the business. So uh, I think you know, we already have our customers on that path, essentially. Will we be doing more in this space over time? Yeah, oh, absolutely, 100%. But uh, our customers are already on the journey to use, again, going back to Peter's word, evolve. And uh, we're super excited about that. They're already on the journey on fabric and mesh, depending on what flavor they want. And by the way, spoiler alert, spoiler alert on the four part blog series. We don't think those are mutually exclusive. We think those are complementary, actually. So uh, have a read. Nothing Thanks, in Shannon. IT gets easier, does it, John? Yeah, right. I mean, this yeah. is really the, the question here. I, I certainly didn't yeah. mean to say anything about elation with this concept, but what, what he's describing to you is that they built the catalog correctly the first time yeah. in precisely anticipating the kind of structural need that he just re represented there in the federated sense. And so that's one of the lessons of governance here is that the decisions that are made in data governance are important. It's not to say that we should be you know, delaying them or that because they're particularly weighty, they take a long time. There are right and wrong answers uh, to these things. But the, the, the key here is to, to catch this. Now, I found no better illustration than the class that I was teaching this semester. It was a totally online business class. And I had a young uh, individual on there who kept saying to me, this stuff is easy. I do this all day. I'm a Tableau developer. And so I got the individual to describe to the class uh, what their role was. And I said, well, I go to this great place and they give me great data and I turn the great data into great stories and everything's wonderful. And John, you're laughing at this point, right? Exactly. There's a lot that's going on in the background. And this was what we were building in our class was the background for this, as well as telling them they had to learn a little bit about the uh, environment that they were working within. So it, it's very much a matter of not as many have experienced this as they should. And the, 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 the description here is how to draw more people into this, because I, as you know, believe strongly in this organizational data literacy concept. And the idea is that if you're going to have two candidates who are equal in all other respects, you should find a way of figuring out which one is the more data literate and hire that candidate over the other one. That's the best way you have to improve your literacy around that. But I'm going to stop talking now or I'll talk the rest of the thing. Anyway, thanks, John. It was a great, great response there. I love it. So um, we definitely do not want to discourage any potential data storage. So what should the expectations be on the first round of data stores in terms of roles and responsibilities? And how do we get executive support for full-time data stewardship positions? So the first question, sorry, the second question is the easiest one, which is justifying a full-time role. Think about the option that you're given oftentimes. I'll give 10 people 10% of their time and that's gonna help you out in this area, right? Uh, well, no, the switching costs are way too high. And we know that all the studies, particularly during the pandemic, where we've got authoritative data now on multitasking, and we just suck at it. Uh, so we definitely want the full-time approach to this in here. And when we have this first round of stewards, what we're saying, I like to think of it as a team, the data team. Again, I don't even like to, to try to as particularly articulate to outsiders beyond this data program concept. But the data team here is gonna help you by putting in things that will keep more data debt from accumulating. But in addition to that, we're gonna clean up the existing data debt. And unfortunately, the scariest movie that I think I ever saw in my life was a PBS program. It was a close up of a person being flossed for the first time in like 10 years or something like this. And it's just the most awful image that you can imagine. I'm so sorry to put that in your heads now. Uh, on this, but many people think about that as getting in with technology, so they just don't have any interest in this. You've got to find the passionate ones, put them in place, make them a team, focus them on some combination of proactive and reactive, and then get them started on saving organizational dollars or helping the organization make more dollars on the top line. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, and I really appreciate the question. I think it's a really central question. I think. Uh, having a, and it, this sounds kind of uh, cliche, but executive support and telling a positive story about the impact to the organization that this role will play, I think is, is one key. You, you know, you, 
what better way to communicate to everyone the importance and to make someone proud to want to be a data steward. I think the other thing that Peter said during his talk was critical, which is, um, you know, I can't remember the exact words, Peter, but you basically I interpreted it as, you know, do, 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 do the things you can, uh, you know, and evolve, right. And, and make it iterative and make the steward a, a participant in that and finding the right things and finding the best way. Right. Uh, think of it as having them not just have responsibilities that are dished out and sort of you have to check all these boxes every day, but you're you're helping us build this. Uh, you're you're part of uh, finding the right solution, and we're going to iterate and we're going to get this thing right. I I think that combined with the rewards, the recognition, and the the understanding universally of the the impact of the role can can have people really excited and excited to go on the journey, understanding it won't always be easy. Some things will work. Some things won't work. Right. There is a, a mint of money to be made by somebody, and I'm not smart enough to do it, John, but I, I know that you've seen in your career people sitting against the walls when we're talking about this, and they've got their mm -hmm. arms folded, and they're business experts. You want to find those people and become friends with them because they know mm -hmm. where everything is in the organization. And then we turn around and we say, oh, well, they're too old to be a steward, you know, or something equally mm -hmm. as dismissive of, of the expertise that's there and their ability to reverse engineer, which can put your governance program light years ahead mm -hmm. of uh, where others are around this. The, the key to it is to, to say to them, there's got to be some measure some connection with what we're doing and what's happening at the organizational strategy level. And if we can't articulate it to management, we're not going to be able to do this at all. And so, uh, again, that catalog gives a piece. And John, I'm going to toss an idea out here for you. Maybe mm -hmm. hopefully everybody else will weigh in on their thoughts. But the, in, in my mind, I drew catalog and the approximately equal to the information architecture mm -hmm. uh, in there, in the sense that the organization has to have a language that it's going to speak. When, when I'm asked to explain what an information architecture is to executives, I say it so that the entire organization, the people in the organization on the business side, the people on the technology side, and the systems of the organization speak the same language. Mm -hmm. They have the same vocabulary in there. So oh, do you yeah. think of the catalog in that same context? Uh, I do. I do. Uh, a slightly different analogy, but uh, let me try it on you. Uh, you know, when I when we look at the pace of change in, in, in architecture, in general, data architecture, all the changes in data sources and BI sources, and this just this rapid explosion we've all experienced in our career, you know, we, we search for the search for the one uh, anchor point, right? The one thing that can can be uh, what we can go to, no matter how much change is going underneath the covers, and it's we can rely on it to find things and understand their context and uh, know who the experts are in it. And to me, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of steal the word data fabric here. You know, the catalog. Uh, I think there's a reason it's at the foundation of Gartner's description of data fabric, and that's that uh, it, it is the one reliable thing. So, you know, it. I, I guess I'll go negative for you for se on, on you for a second. I see a lot of reference architectures by. Um, by consultants, which will go and name big, big consulting shops. And they have the, they have all these boxes on a chart and they're one of 50 boxes is catalog. And they're kind of treating it like it's your, you know, it's, it's kind of the new flavor of your grandfather's data dictionary. Uh, and I think they're, 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 they're really um, not understanding its power as this fabric across all this change uh, that really empowers everyone, uh, people that do governance, including stewards, but the business and, and that kind of, leads me back, I mean, to that, you, you, you mentioned literacy again, Peter, and, um, and, and, you know, and I think it helps, it helps literacy and culture and all those things. And uh, by the way, just final thought, um, we're actually going through a process of trying to, you know, help put together sort of an open standard framework around measuring literacy and measuring culture, you know, and it's, 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 it's not easy, because there's a lot of subjectivity in there, but uh, super excited about that work. So anyway. Thanks for the chance, Super. Peter. Appreciate it. I hope I hope you didn't didn't distract you with that. I added the word trusted to the catalog <laughs> because you were talking about like that it. as a yeah. key piece, right? That they have trust in that. Sorry, Shannon, we need to get back to your oh, question. Oh, it has to there, be. Yeah, it you, has sir. to be. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love the discussion. I knew I knew you two would be a great pair to to. You probably could, could do hours in a whole conference. We'd be with, wonderful with at a cocktail party. <laughs> <laughs> It's awesome. Well, at least the amongst passion. data people, I'd probably go quite well, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Um, so well, speaking of, you know, along the same lines, you know, in cataloging, um, so is, is there a way to make cataloging, 
cataloging of business terms and reference data easier. The business uh, metadata cataloging and viewing does not seem to be as easy as it is with technical metadata. Uh, that one's oh. for me, I assume, or is, was that for Peter? It, it came in. Um, Go for it, John. Um, but, yeah. yeah, but I'm sure okay. Peter has an opinion too. Yeah. Okay. Now, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, if, if anyone wants to follow up through you, Shannon, afterwards, and I'd love to um, uh, be able to have a direct one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I know, you know, we have customers managing and using, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, terms and reference data and, uh, you know, very, very successful with that. So I'd love to understand this person's experience and then help them out. Um, uh, are, are we always doing more? Sure, we're always doing more. We have a release that's coming out this week and, you know, there's more, there's more on glossaries. Uh, we already have an extremely, you know, powerful glossary capability, but we're, we're kind of double down, doubling down on a lot of this stuff and trying to, you know, um, extend the usefulness uh, even from where we are. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, unless I get into specifics, I, I, I probably couldn't say any more. That said, I think it's a good response and it gets back to the idea that you're not probably going to go out and populate your catalog, populate your glossary in a quick one-time repeat. Uh, again, what you're going to do is take and put in place a culture that values and understands and wants to reduce the imprecision, the uncertainty, the doubt that exists in organizations that isn't trusted data in there. And in each cycle of this, you try and chip off a little bit more at what you're trying to do. So maybe we don't go after the A's because they're first. Maybe we find the data that's going to make the biggest difference and attack that particular set. Find the area where the organization has experienced challenges. And the only way, of course, you're going to find that is by putting the councils together that John described as well. And I didn't articulate them quite as much, but it, it is what these individuals are, are doing in order to, to, to keep afloat. The, the question is, how do we understand what's going on from other perspectives? And it's never going to happen just because it gets lucky. Instead, what's going to happen here is that you're going to have a group of dedicated individuals. Whoops, I went to the wrong slide. Sorry, guys. Back up. You're going to have a group of dedicated individuals who are going to become specialists at this area. That's the whole point of the teams that you're looking at. And they will be able to connect the dots to understand that going forward here, we can fix data at a root cause level as opposed to an instance level. And only by doing that in that type of a context are you going to actually be able to come up with really good results around the organization. So again, the data things are disguised. They don't look like data problems, but I assure you there is not a business problem that exists that doesn't have data at the root cause of it and be able to pull it together. And the catalog is just one of the ways of pulling together the vocabulary. The other part of it is pulling together the people and process issues, which are what we're talking about in terms of those communities. And the goal is to have people meeting and talking about data regularly. If you've ever worked for an organization that has gone through a safety transformation, and I have worked for several of them, and it is an amazing thing to see. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. But when the organization starts out every meeting that you go to in an entire year and they start out with a safety minute, you know that culture has changed there. They're not simply paying lip service to it. The same type of transformation has to occur here and that is not gonna happen by Friday, no matter how hard you work uh, at that particular process. So <clears throat> hopefully that gives a, a, a bit of idea around the cataloging function. Great place to start. It leads to your gamification components too. As John was describing, he probably doesn't like that term, but it is the kind of thing that we need to involve younger people in. Uh, it, it is also a good way of building up, used properly, a good way of building up expertise and acknowledged expertise uh, in organizations. Uh, so it's a, a, a wonderful, wonderful development. It's something that, that we should pay more attention to, but it hasn't been a huge part up to this point of what we're looking at. I think we're ready for the next question, Shannon. I love it. And I just wanna address, there was a question in here um, asking where to get your books. Um, and so I put a link in the um, Q&A also in the chat there. You can get them on Amazon or from um, Technix Publications, which is Peter's Anythingawesome.com. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Shana. You're welcome. I love it. Um, all right. So uh, now 
this next question, it does not have such a short answer. We've done a webinar on this next question. In fact, there's a couple of people who came in with the same thing, uh, very similar, you know, data management and data governance tends to be used interchangeably. So how important is maintaining the distinction between these two? Many organizations talk about the difference between uh, what, which is sort of a requirement, and then how, which is an implementation component. And to think about them in that sense, certainly there's going to be overlap, at least in the vocabularies uh, that they're describing and, and other types of things. But the real question is, you have to identify that there is work that needs to be done by the organization in order to create, to eliminate the data debt that's out there. And if, if the data governance group is busy, then there needs to be another group formally set up to implement these changes. And uh, it's simply not the case that you can say, oh, we don't need to do data anymore uh, around this. John, how do you want to dive, dive in on that one? Did I give you yeah. enough ramp? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about your the matrix you shared, right, where you had all of the the arrows between the four boxes. I don't know how many people remember that, but um, it's it struck me as uh, you know we we talk about decision rights a lot. So so the difference between data management and data governance to me, yes, there's there's obviously budgetary motivation and and reporting lines of reporting and all that stuff is is super important. But ultimately, what I think uh, I think about is people have to get work done and people have to know what their responsibility is. And I think of it as almost like a super powered racy matrix, right? Decision rights uh, matrix. And um, so let's take something very, let's take something very specific, right? As an example. So let's say uh, someone goes into the catalog, they find the world's best table about customer. They see 18 other people, their colleagues have upvoted. It looks like exactly the right table. They click through on a particular column last name and they see a warning from someone who just ran a query an hour ago. And it says, looks like the data has gone bad. Um, they click the button and say, uh, you know, click the button to for somebody to remediate. Well, who remediates? Is that a technical steward? Is it a database administrator? Is it the system owner who owns the table that owns the column? Um, someone has to take a ticket and go do some root cause analysis and, and they have to solve it. So that's where I come back to. At the end of the day, you get down to getting real work done and decision rights and I think you just have to have that spelled out. People have to understand. So ultimately you're gonna cross boundaries between data management and governance and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and people just need to know what that, what that map is. Uh, I think that's, that's the way that we think about it. That's I the shortest answer anyway. I could give Shannon because <laughs> yep. that is definitely a half day topic but that's the shortest I can do. It is for sure. And Peter, were you going to add something to that? No, no, I was going to say next question. It's just perfectly covered. Yeah, you know, I mean, the question came in a couple of times. I mean, feel free to, um, you know, expand, you know, it says so there's a, there was an answer, you know. Um, well, in, in my uh, mind, it, it's just exactly what John said. There's some work that needs to be done. And if nobody's doing the work, then we need to, you know, create a new individual. If we've got people that are underemployed, then we can certainly utilize them. Again, I don't want to sound callous about it. What we're doing is not rocket science, but it is a skill that you need to learn and, and understand. And it makes sense to specialize in it as opposed to just saying, hey, you should rotate through here and in six months, you'll know everything you need to know. No, it doesn't work that way. It's a, a very different process and we need to, to dive further into it. I'll give, I'll give one other example. Um, do, do we have a moment, Shannon? We do, absolutely. Okay, yep. okay. Um, so in our active data governance process that I, I said is prescriptive and people can use it if they find it useful, you know, we talk about three dimensions of stewardship, uh, business technical compliance stewardship. And, and then we, we say, okay, for different asset classes, terms, metrics, business process description, all the data, data source, table, uh, 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 column, file, file, you know, all that. For all these classes of assets, um, you're going to have you're going to have attributes on them, right? And you want to have deep attribution, right? Because that gives people the greatest context, and they can learn, understand many things about um, about those assets. Um, but different assets um, on let's take something simple again, like a column. Uh, there could be uh, assets around classification. Uh, that's you know, is it is it PII 
information, right? Is it, is it sensitive personal information? Uh, there could be a related policy. Um, so that's compliance related. There could be other data health, data quality. And if those go bad, right, that's more technical. There could be uh, business titling, business description, um, you know, top, top business consumers attachment to lineage and business reports. So my point is, it doesn't mean you have to have necessarily a steward for all those roles, but when you route the compliance uh, issues, wh who do you route to, right? So again, going back to decision rights, crossing boundaries, uh, what groups and what people and what groups have responsibility for remediating, uh, making decisions, um, making new policy, right? All that stuff. And so uh, I think you just need to map it out. It's hard work, uh, but all those routes, if you will, all those Think of them as swim lanes if it helps, right? Need to be need to be mapped out. And then failure to do it is sort of like leaving the checklist off the plane, right? Yeah. And uh, we yeah. know that's one of the things that's been most helpful in aviation safety in terms of uh, improvements in those areas. Thanks, John. Now, great, great stuff. Good time that's for one great. more, Shannon. Yeah. Um, that's it. Those that's all the questions right now. So <laughs> I love it. But it's been such a great conversation um, again. And thank you, John. And thanks to Alation for um, sponsoring today's webinar. Well, thank you. Make these webinars happen. Yeah, our pleasure. Yeah. Been lots of great comments in there. Um, uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to submit them and I'll get them over to John and uh, Peter. So uh, again, thanks everybody. A reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session. I'll have uh, links to the Peter's, where you can buy Peter's many, many books. Again, the most recent on data literacy, which is awesome. Um, also I'll include a, a link to, we recently had Alation join us for Dataversity Demo Day data catalogs. Um, so you can see a demo of Alation as well um, off of our website there. So, and of course you can sign up for more demos and in-person demo, personal demo from Alation as well. So thank you, John. Thanks, Peter, so much. Thanks everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Hopefully see a bunch of you in June at DGIQ. John, yeah, thanks so absolutely. much for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. Appreciate it. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.